All right, in this video, we're going to look at five sample questions that you may see on the uh, DMA 50 portion of the placement test. And DMA 50 covers graphs and equations of lines. So we'll uh, do some graphical and algebraic representations of lines, as well as some basic graphs, such as line graphs, bar graphs, circle graphs, etc. Even though these next five questions we cover will not cover DMA 50 uh, thoroughly, you can find more DMA videos at the following website. So let's go ahead and have a look at the first question. Uh, it's kind of, hopefully you can still read this. Uh, watch it in HD. Um, there's normally an icon down here at the bottom on YouTube where you can change the quality of the video. But nonetheless, so we got a graph and it says the linear equation graphed above gives the amount of money company H has saved Y years after the company opened. According to the graph, how many years after the company opened did they save $10,000? So just, um, I mean, this is a relatively cut and dry problem, but just making sure you can read a graph correctly. So this represents one year after the company opened. So one year after the company opened, they saved 2000 Then two years after, they had saved an additional 2000 which means they had 4000 in all. Because notice this says the total amount. So it's kind of like adding. And since this is a linear function, they're saving $2,000 every year. $2,000 after year one, $4,000 after year two, six thousand dollars after year three and maybe you see the pattern um, we're looking for how many years did they save or after how many years did they save ten grand so ten grand right here they did that after five years that's our answer to question number one and that's a linear function um, now don't get it twisted later on in life you might be seeing graphs uh, that do something like this uh, some, it has like a little curve to it maybe something like something like that so but DMA 50, linear function, so all your graphs will have the same what's called, it has the same rate of change. They're saving the same amount every year. Now question number two, let's zoom in on this. Anita's department store determined that if a specific shirt is priced at $50 each, on average there would be 200 shirts sold each month. Uh, the shirt is available for sale. The number of shirts sold per month would decrease by 10 for each $5 of increase in price. So we got something going on. Shirts selling for 50 bucks, they would sell on average 200 shirts. But if they raised, if they increased the price by $5, they're going to sell 10 less shirts. Let's think about this. Uh, let's think, okay, um, 200 shirts, well let's say 50 bucks at $50 they'd sell 200 shirts. And I'm gonna put a comma in between here and you'll see, you'll see why. Now, $5 increase. So if they increase the price to $55, they're predicting that the number of shirts sold would decrease by 10. So that means if they price the shirts at $55, they'd only sell 190 because the shirts would decrease by 10 uh, for each $5 increase. So at 60 bucks, it, it decreased by another 10 and so forth. So if we increase the price of the shirt to $65, it only sell 170. And the reason why I'm putting commas in between here because we want to think of these things as order pairs. Now you could easily reverse these two numbers. You could, you could say 200 shirts at $50, so we could write it as 200 comma 50. But the reason why I did it like this is just to show you uh, X and Y and we're trying to find the graph below. So if P represents the price of the shirt in dollars and X, or excuse me, S represents the average number of shirts sold, which of the following graphs represents the relationship between P and S? Um, so we got two variables. We got P, we got S. Price and number of shirts sold. And we're trying to find these points on our graph. And this graph should decrease because, look, price of shirts, that's gonna be our first number, the number of shirts sold is going to be our second number. Notice this line does decrease. This line increases. Let's talk about why this is wrong. They're saying if they sold the, well, first of all, what's the original price? $50, $200, or $50 per shirt, 200 shirts. $50 price of shirts. That looks like, that dot right there, it looks like it's not even at 200. It looks like it's at about maybe 230. That, that one's definitely not right just because of that. Um, because we're looking for that point 50 and that should be 200 so that's definitely not right plus this increase in two let's look at this one down here 
at $50 per shirt, this one's at $220. I mean, that one right there is not right either. We should have a dot. If the price of the shirt is $50, we should be right there for this graph to be correct because they were going to sell 200 shirts. So, you know, that's not right either. Um, not even to mention the fact that, that what these two graphs are showing, they're saying that if you increase the price of the shirt, notice the price is going up, they're saying you're going to sell more shirts. And that's not the case because we're going to sell less shirts. So let's just try to find the one that has $50 per shirt for 200 shirts, first of all. Here's $50 per shirt. Look at where that dot is. $50 per shirt, they'll sell 200 shirts. All right, that one looks good. I'm going to come down here and check this one. $50 per shirt. Oh, there you go. Look at that. $50 per shirt, that's saying they're going to sell around $170. So the only answer that we can have based on that original point um, before I even talked about this stuff, this is the only one that's going to work. But let's see these other points as well since we talked about it. If we raise the price to 55, we should drop down and only sell 190 shirts. So if we raise the price up to 55, we should drop down and sell 190 shirts. That fits perfectly. If we drop the price, or excuse me, if we raise the price another five dollars to 60, so let's go up here to 60. What is it saying? How many, how many shirts are we going to sell? 180 right there? Yeah, that looks perfect. And that's exactly what that says. $60 per shirt, 180 shirts. So A is your answer there. Number three, let me see if I can squeeze all this up here. A computer help, self, or help service charges an initial fee to join the service plus an additional charge for each hour of help service a customer uses. If the computer service company charges a total of $140 for the initial fee and a two-hour help session, and a total of $220 for the initial fee and a four-hour help session, which of the following expressions gives the computer company's charge for each hour of help service that a customer uses? Okay, this $140 represents the initial fee and two hours of help. So it's not just the initial fee, it's both of these things. Uh, $220 initial fee and four hours. So notice, yes, we are paying more um, for four hours of help. Now this initial fee is the same for both of them, but what we're trying to find is, is what's called a rate of change. And the way you think about it is, uh, slope is something you're gonna see a lot in DMA 50. We think of it as Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. And it looks like the Ys, all of these are representing, well in this case they're representing prices, and they won't charge per hour, charge per hour. So charge, if we think of charge per hour, that means we want price up top, we want time at the bottom. Notice here, we got time at the top, price at the bottom. We don't want that, we don't want that one. Now, the difference, the rate of change is the difference between the charges divided by the difference between your time. So this one right here is adding them. That's not what we want. This is the only one that's gonna work, and let's talk about it. So notice the, the Y2, think of uh, one of your Y values, or in this case, one of the prices. They have a 220, so I'm gonna write down 220. Subtract the other charge, 140. And what's important here about finding slope or the rate of change is that if I used a certain price up here, I wanna make sure I use the time that corresponds to this price down here. So we don't wanna put the two hours right here because remember, it was $220 for the four hour session. So this is like the time, and this is the price for that time. You wanna make sure these two are lined up, just like these two would be lined up now. So we automatically subtract two according to this formula. And there's our answer, but let's talk about this. 220 minus 140, that's gonna give you 80. Four minus two gives you two. So we're talking about $80 for two hours. Let's simplify this. 80 divided by two is going to be $40 per one hour of service. Now that's not addressed in this problem. They just want you to find the formula to use, but that's what they're charging per hour. All right, so that's it for there. Now you may say, okay, let's talk about it a little bit more since we're um, in the middle of this problem anyway. If they charge $40 for one hour of service, how much are they gonna pay for two hours of service? Just based on this. If they're paying $40 per hour for two hours, that means they're gonna pay 80 bucks. But notice it says $140 is what they paid. You gotta remember that initial fee. The initial fee, well if it's $80 for two hours of help because it's $40 per hour, where does the 140 come from? They're gonna pay a $60 initial fee, IF, initial fee. 
Now check out how this initial fee is going to be the same for this charge down here as well. All right, four hours of help. Four hours of help at $40 per hour is going to be 160 bucks because $40 for one hour, we're doing it for four hours, so 40 times four is 160. Well, let's take that initial fee. It shouldn't be any different, regardless of how much time you get. Well, what's 160 plus 60? That's going to be 220, and notice that's exactly how much you're going to pay for the initial fee and four hours of help. So this right here remains the same, regardless for how many hours of help you get, whereas the price that you pay here is going to change depending on how many hours of help you get. Now, I know I went a lot deeper into that problem, but it, it's, it's worth talking about. I mean, you're going to see this stuff covered anyway in a DMA 50 class. Number four, Jen scored 16 points in a new card game where each player could receive either two or four points each round. If Jen received X amount of two-point scores and Y amount of four-point scores, what does the x-intercept of the graph in the xy plane of the equation 2x plus 4y equals 16 indicate? Okay, <laughs> um, x-intercept. This is a topic you'll cover uh, relatively heavily in DMA 50. And I'm going to talk about y-intercept too. The way you find an x-intercept is you plug 0 into y. So to find the x-intercept, we're going to plug 0 into y. Vice versa, to find the y-intercept, we plug 0 into x. Now, I'm just mentioning that, but it doesn't talk about a y-intercept in this problem. But these two work very similar. So they give us an equation, 2x plus 4y equals 16. Well, what the heck does this mean? Remember, Jen did score 16 points. And she could have got it either by scoring 2 points in x number of rounds, or she could score 4 points in y number of rounds. We use an x and a y because she could have, got, uh, she could have scored more 2 points in more rounds than she scored 4 points in these amount of rounds. So x and y could be different numbers of rounds. Nonetheless, it says, what does the x-intercept of the graph uh, indicate? Well, x-intercept, to find an x-intercept, you want to plug 0 into y. Let's take this equation and let's plug 0 into y. That's exactly what I'm doing right there. I'm just replacing that y with the 0. Um, so 2x plus 4 times 0, that's really just adding 0, so we don't even need that. So 2x is equal to 16, and therefore we get x equals 8. Therefore, this point on a graph would be 8, 0 because we got x equals 8. And remember, we plug 0 into the y. That's exactly what this is talking about up here. Well, what does this mean? x is 8. So she got, she in 8 rounds, let's think of that 8 right there because she received 8 amounts. But let's just say she scored 2 points in 8 rounds. If she scored 2 points in 8 rounds, that's all 16 of her points. So she scored two points in eight rounds. That's all 16 of her points. That means she did not score four points in any round. That's the exact answer right there. X-intercepts and Y-intercepts always work like that. Uh, X-intercept, plug zero into Y, which is what we did. If it did say find the Y-intercept, we would plug zero into X, and that would tell you the exact opposite. That would mean that Jen scored all her uh, points in four-point rounds versus two-point rounds. But nonetheless, x-intercept here, not the y-intercept. All right, last question, number five. So we have a graph right here, and what do we want to do with it? Let's see. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let me take this right here and copy that up a little bit. That'll be a lot easier to read, I think. Kind of blurry, but it'll be all right. All right, so which of the following is true about the line graphed in the xy plane to the left now? All right, so we want to find a slope. It looks like we're looking for a slope, and we're looking for a y-intercept. Y-intercepts are relatively easy to find because you want to look at your y-axis, and you want to find where it crosses the y-axis. The y-intercept is 2. Well, bam, <laughs> that's our answer because, oh, no, just kidding. These two we don't want. Because it says the y-intercept is negative 3, that means that line would have crossed down here, and it clearly doesn't. So now we just want to find the slopes, and notice the two slopes are different. Two-thirds or three-halves, which one is it? Slope is equal to rise over run. So let's pick two nice dots on this graph. 
Um, some of these lines are kind of blurred out, but it looks like it crosses nicely. Like right there, I don't want to pick that one because it doesn't cross where like, you know, the, the two grade lines are. But it looks like right here is a pretty good one. There probably is another one somewhere in between here, but nonetheless, um, that's a nice point. It looks like that point is six, six actually, you know, six, six. See that? Well, what do we have to do to get from this pink dot to this pink dot? Let's do the rise first. So let's rise. We got to go up one, two, three, four. We rise four. So that's a positive four. And now we got to run to the right. Whenever you run to the right, that's a positive number as well. So we run to the right one, two, three, four, five, six. Simplify that fraction. We can divide both of these by two. Four divided by two is two. Six divided by two is three. So the slope is two thirds. This is the right one. Where people can mess up here is they would do like a run over rise and slope is always going to be rise over run. To hit on something else that a lot of people often confuse, it, I could have easily have said this. To get from this pink dot down here to this pink dot, we would rise down or go down rather one, two, three, four. That would be a negative four because we're going down. So up is positive, down is negative. Now you might say, well, I thought we get a positive answer over here. Well, we went down four. Now we have to go to the left. One, two, three, four, five, six. When you move to the left, that's also a negative move and a negative divided by a negative will give you that, which simplifies to give you that. So the big thing here is this. Slope is rise over run, not run over rise. So that's our answer to number five. And there you have it, that's five quick questions that you may see on the DMA 50 portion of the placement test. Even though we didn't cover all of these topics in detail, you can find plenty of videos that cover all the DMA 50 material at the following website. And that's it for this video. Hope it helped.